Today is May 25th, and this week in track and field, we're talking about the World Athletics' recent decision uh, to change indoor track, to call it short track. They're killing the little queue at the World Championships and the Olympics for the heats and semis of the 1500, then uh, and the steeplechase. The U.S. is facing a big problem when it comes to qualifying for the Olympic marathon, so we'll unpack that. And then we'll look ahead to some of the biggest races of the weekend in L.A. and Rabat. But first, I got to crack open an Olipop. Kyle, what flavor you got? You got the Caitlin Tui favorite? The vintage cola. I'm a sucker for the lemon lime. Uh, recently, you know, it, it's a it, n- nothing from you, Mac. No, I need I need to get more. <laughs> I drank oh. all of it. Your gut health must be in good shape. I bought thirty six of them pretty recently, and then I was just like, oh, obviously, this will last a, a, enough episodes that we'll always have one when we sit down. And I drank like three on a couple of days, and they disappear. Has Leisha tried it yet? Like, have you given her a little sip or anything? I don't think you know how like babies work. <laughs> <laughs> kind of <dumb. laughs> milk and water all right well yeah, you haven't it, put it like in a bottle for her it's just you know yeah we don't really strawberry it. vanilla or any type well summer's right around the corner and so if you've got friends over you know hand them an olipop have them give it a try for the first time it's refreshing it's good for you good for your gut health uh we've been drinking it for months you'll see us at track meets uh this summer Throwing back some Olipops. So visit drinkolipop.com and use code Sidious25 for 25% off. And recently I had a friend of mine who was just like, 25 is it's a good chunk. So it's like, use the code 25% off. Get your on your online orders at drinkolipop.com. All right. Let's start with the World Athletics name change. Indoor track is being renamed Short Track. Uh, the change is going to be approved in August, and this is going to allow for 200 meter tracks which is, you know, everyone's favorite indoors to be, uh, recognized for world records out at, you know, outdoors. And so like, this is kind of like really opened up the opportunities for more makeshift tracks out there. It's going to take some getting used to Kyle, your first impressions over this, this name change. Well, I think like the big thing initially is that everyone just reads the headline and is kind of laughing like short track, you know, what is this speed skating? um what's it like like it's just a a rebrand of some sort but there is some actual reason for this but it's much funnier to just joke about the fact that no one is going to call it short track so it opens up the whole entire southern hemisphere basically that you know the weather has always been nice enough that they don't have to have their own version of the milrose games or anything really indoors and now you're going to be able to construct a 200 meter track, you know, in somewhere in South America or in Africa and host, you know, meets and, and contest these distances. But uh, so it, I, I guess that's one thing. And then I guess it also opens up for more of these street meet type uh, deals that we've seen over the last couple of years. Do you like it, Mac? Uh, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, I think you can kind of imagine what it could be. And I think what, it could be is really cool uh like courtyards or just open spaces like in in like urban areas i think has potential to create a pretty electric atmosphere um but it has to be like a big enough production i think to to be exciting to be something that everyone's like oh wow that looks awesome i want to go to that if it's just some like rinky dink badly uh built track that's dangerous i don't think that that's gonna work there if it, if it gets, i like the ceiling if it gets so dangerous though at a certain point i might come back around to it like and it actually might be fun yeah. um like, but I, yeah i no. mean it's essentially like it doesn't actually like are you gonna call it short track it's gonna take some. I, games, like I guess, like I, even when they made the first change from from IAAF to World Athletics, like I was like, oh, this is gonna like it's gonna take a while. And then it really actually just happened fairly quickly that it's like, oh, everything's now you know World Athletics and no longer you. You sound really old school if you refer to it as the IAAF, but um, this one, I guess, like the change is starting at the top. It's coming from World Athletics. 
it's gonna take a while i think before like you have high schoolers around the country being like oh yeah i'm signing up for short track this season yeah well i mean we called it winter track in high school and then it turned into indoor track you know so i i think we can go one more and just call it short track would would you have considered any other alternative to to short <laughs> smaller track littler track littler track this leaves, <laughs> this leaves uh doesn't this leave u-dub in a weird spot because it's 300 medium track medium track <laughs> um but i you know i i have long argued that it's really easy to create a cool atmosphere indoors because 200 meter you, you need half the number of fans to line the track mm -hmm. which we struggle to do outdoors quite often but we can do it indoors or now we can do it anywhere and i i would just say like the the space uh, like you're saying the space required for a track is now similar to what like a soccer field is like a indoor track is still huge it's still 90 meters from like lane six on one end turn to the other lane six on the other side it's huge um and yeah that makes it just way better as a you know as a spectator um i think it could be cool but uh, i don't know like are we going to see something in this next year i think we're well, selling 400 meter tracks no more yeah. it's too big it's ridiculous <laughs> who has the space for a 400 meter track um but i think it's going to take world athletics to actually put on an event in south america like i it, i don't it's going to take a big effort, I think, to show us uh, and money to show us like what it's capable of. The, the the people complaining on Twitter has been pretty funny, though, like the the jokes and the memes that have come out of it. It's like, all right, we're dealing with like so many other issues, but someone in a meeting raised their hand and be like, let's change indoor track to short track. And then at the, the whole meeting paused and it's like, you know what? This guy's on to something. <laughs> you're, you're consider yourself promoted. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. We spent a lot of time on, on short track. Um, let's the other big change from world athletics this past week is that they are scrapping the little Q. And so that means that qualification to the next round of the distance events in both the heats and the semis will be based on place only, not on time. And what world athletics said was that you know, there's been widespread feedback on uh, disadvantage to athletes in the first heat or semifinal, and that the advantages would go to the athletes in the subsequent heat. So uh, if this is coming from like the athletes and coaches, I mean, it's got some merit to it. Racing is back. The numbers, if you dive into it, start like definitely show that in recent years, most of the time qualifiers have come from the second heat of things. And so Kylie, did you, in this week's edition of the lap count, you said, you know, common sense prevailed here. It's supposed to be a little bit easier for fans uh, to be able to take in and observe the sport and understand what's, what's going on. And so you were in favor of this right from the get-go. Everyone who understands anything about track and field should be in support of this rule. It's a real like litmus test here of whether or not you deserve to have opinions on track and field. <laughs> Everyone... This is like the most universally loved thing that World Athletics has done in such a long time. Uh, although I, I do think that they gave us the refugee heats or however you could say it, just so that they could eventually take it away to similar applause. Um, this is just like, it's simple. Think of like, you show up to watch the World Championships or Olympics, you're a fringe fan, and you have to sit there like calculating the decimals of the previous couple heats to figure out if the guy from your country made it through. Like, it's just too complicated. And I I think it makes sense because previously we were getting five time qualifiers out of the 5,000. I mean, it's not and even the like steeple a too. And that's like more than half. The, that's like half the field, right? The steeple though, I, I will say the steeple goes honest more than the 1500 or 5k because there is that benefit of leading and um, the best guys want to have a little room for error in case they clip a hurdle. But, you know, in the 1500, if you go out and, 58 or 60 you can make that up whereas in the 5k like your first lap might be 70 and then you're immediately done and you have to go for a big queue so everyone who knows anything is happy with this mac how do you see this kind of changing 
the way races play out? I mean, do you think it's just going to be super slow prelims that just lead to insane kicks? Like this, it sounds on paper good for Centro's move up to the 5K for for Paris if that's if that's the case. I don't think it's going to affect things in that way. Uh, I th- there was a lot of people thinking like, oh, everyone's just going to jog now. I yeah. think it's the opposite. I think um, before, if you knew your heat was slow, you would double down and you would run even slower. Like the field's like, okay, well, we're not going to be the time qualifiers immediately. And now it's it's equal for everyone and there isn't one heat influencing another. So before you would double down and go slower because you knew that the second one was guaranteed to go fast. Now it's like, all right, what is giving me the best shot in this race? And I'll, now since 2016, the 15 has gotten way faster. People don't mess around and run 62 seconds or 60 seconds for the first lap anymore. Like they run, you know, the fitter guys are going to go to the front. They're going to run hard. Um, and I think I, I would wager that the accumulative time for the heats will be faster in this format than previously. Um, and I, to Kyle's point, if you see the comments, anyone that's been good or is good in the sport uh, that has, you know, run and, and competed, they love this. So uh, I think for the athletes and the coaches, it's really fair knowing exactly what you have to do in order to give yourself the best chance to make it through. Um, and that's all you're looking for. Like everyone's so good and talent level is just so close that it's all about giving yourself the best opportunity and best odds. And you can make the best decisions knowing exactly how many places are going to go into the next round. And then you can race accordingly. Okay. But how about this? Cause I had a friend text me who said, I think in the sprints specifically in the hundred and 200, it should only be little cues. And I said, hot take, I would go the opposite completely. I think that they should go big cues only across the board. And so I went back and I looked at the world championships. Heat seven had a negative 0.3 headwind and heat five had a 1.1 tailwind. Yeah, so you can't do it. These- yeah, you can't. Mother nature is deciding who goes to the final. And, so and if anything, it seems like the hundred would benefit from big cues as well, because you're getting why that's the difference of, you know, a full 10th of a second at least. And so those guys are being pinned up against each other, like in terms of who, who gets to go through the next round. I don't know. I mean, if anything, you, you don't need many small cues in the sprints as well. As we talk about like other events, like, this starts at the 1500, 5K, and steeple, 10K, there's only one round, doesn't make a difference. But uh, the 800 is going to remain the same, where it is three sections and top two plus the next two fastest. The little Q survives there. Would you extend it down to the 800 as well? And I guess, like, what's the reason why it stayed? I'm big Q's only. I mean, I would hope that they looked at the analysis and said, hey, you know, this time qualifiers are happening all across the board and there's not a trend of, it's always coming from one heat, the last heat. Um, But it just, it it gets more confusing the more heats there are. Yeah. But yeah. Remember uh, in Eugene, the, uh, the board was struggling to show times quickly. And we were in this situation where it's like, who's making it through and like no one in stadium actually knew who was making it through each round because the the clock wasn't showing on the board. So people were checking their phones that like, if it's just placed, just big cues, you don't have to do that. You don't have to check times. So in terms of in-person experience, it makes much more sense to only have big cues. It's such a weird feeling to be one of the bubble qualifiers and having to watch following heats I mean, you're just sitting there. You're like, uh, like in the one time that they did it where they actually, I think it was like at a European indoor championship or something like that. They actually had like the hot seat where like they sat you down, you were in the chair and then there was a camera on you watching the next race. And like, yeah. that was entertaining and thrilling, but it's like, you're, they're not doing that at, you know, a world championships or Olympics. So it's like, it doesn't like you can do away with it. I mean, there are situations in which you are cooling down. Because there are so many heats. Yeah. You know, like think of it from like a hundred guys perspective. If you ran heat one and you're waiting to see if heat eight goes or not, like, you know, you got an hour, like you, you are 
do you, do you cool down or do you just sit there and watch? Like it's, it's a really fascinating mental experiment as well um, to have to watch yourself get bumped out of the next heat. And yeah. Kyle, where uh, did you ever enjoy just observing other people's reaction to getting bumped out in that room? I because always found what, it what, fascinating yeah, yeah. when people started throwing like water bottles and stuff like that. I'm like, all right, come on. You'll you know making the team anyway. Yeah, you, like you, you're there. I mean, I I referenced it in the lab count this week. Like I had a 345. I was the first guy on the bubble in the 1500 USA's, and I see the next heat go out fast. I'm just like done. All right, immediately, like just walk away. Like I don't have, I know how this goes. And then once someone takes it out in a somewhat reasonable time, one of the other. 14 guys in the field is just gonna be like, all right, well, I'm not going to squander the fact that this guy took us out in 58. Like I'll do my part. And so I'm happy to say goodbye to all that. <laughs> is it, Are we going to run into any sort of, I guess like it's a championship. So it all comes down to racing and beating like the next, the person next to you where it's like, I guess there's going to be people who are concerned about the, still the draw and some, yeah, heat, you know, some heats being more stacked than others, but this is a case of caring about people who shouldn't matter. Uh, sure. Like, why are we arguing about how the 12th guy gets in? Like, if you can't get in by being the top, um, you know, six to whatever in your heat, you're not going to medal. <laughs> like, if you can't get through the first round by being top six, like, the likelihood is it's not your week, dude. So, like, move on. Where we really just want to make sure that Jakob gets through, right? Like, and he can get through however he wants. Yeah. All right. So, everyone's in favor of this one, and we'll get to see it in action for the first time in Budapest. And then they're going to, you know, roll with it uh, at the Paris Olympics. Okay. Next thing. We're just, you know, problem solving on this episode. Yeah. Next, of the next, next problem. Uh, the United States has a big issue right now when it comes to qualifying for the Olympic marathon. So uh, the basic breakdown, and this was flagged to a lot of people last week by uh, James McCurdy, the coach out of Flagstaff, who's putting on you know a marathon this fall aimed at getting more Olympic qualifiers and Olympic trials qualifiers. So he's been looking at what it takes to get to those stages very carefully. And the he noticed that, the U.S. is the men specifically are facing an issue. So, right now, countries can send up to three athletes. Okay, that hasn't changed. The target field size for the Olympics is eighty. The Olympic standard is two hundred eight ten for the men, two twenty six fifty for the women. And you can also get in by achieving a top ten finish at a platinum level race, and that's a top lot five. of uh, top five at a at a a lot of the majors. Um. Athletes who are ranked in the top 65, max three per country, are considered qualified, and spots can be reallocated by a federation to athletes who have achieved 211.30 or 229.30. So each country has a final say on which qualified athletes will be selected. And so um, the United States, USATF, will utilize the reallocation of spots if we have three spots unlocked. Uh, then all those athletes have to do is finish top three at the Olympic trials and have run under 211.30 or two or 229.30 by the time that the race in Orlando concludes. So good luck to the people broadcasting this on NBC, having to explain this to people if things don't improve between now and next February. And so on the women's side of things for Team USA, it's not a problem because we already have those three spots unlocked. You have enough women qualified. We have people like Emma Bates finishing top five. And so those boxes have been checked. The top three women at the US Olympic trials, as long as they've run under 229.30, will go to Paris. Now on the men's side, we currently don't have any spots unlocked. And no one has run under the Olympic standard of 208.10. And no one is ranked in the top 65. So there's a good chance that if no one runs a fast marathon between now and February or gets their ranking high enough, they're going to go into the trials in Orlando hoping to run sub 208.10. 
in Orlando on that flat course in the humidity, like there's so many variables to consider. Then at some point in the race, like you'll realize the pace and if they're off, then like, it's just a, it's just a marathon, I guess. Like no one's going to, to the Olympics. And I don't know, I didn't look it up, but I can't remember the last time team USA didn't send an American man to, to the Olympic games for the marathon, but Kyle, you wrote about it. How do we fix this problem? Well, first off, the problem could be fixed if World Athletics published their Road to Paris tool before the fall, which is when it's planned on being released. So we can get an idea of rankings because the rankings require two top performances. And right now, you know, the American men would have three guys in that top 65 position and therefore be okay. But those three men do not have two performances in the window. And so we don't know essentially where everyone sits and what needs to be done. And that's the big question mark. You know, I I was talking to a top agent this morning and they were saying essentially like, I think the U S is going to be fine. Like, you know, we're being alarmist. They're going to be fine. We're going to have three men ranked in the top 65, but that does require everyone to not everyone, but a number of people to go run well this fall. If everyone's sitting back and says, Hey, you know, the beginning of February is pretty close to the fall marathon season. I'm going to let someone else go knock out the ranking and, you know, I'll just beat them on the day that it counts. Then we run into an issue. And so, um, you know, if you're an American man or a fan of an American man, then essentially you want to make sure that your guy has definitely run under 2 1130, which Courier, Zanislavski, Simbasa, Kibet, McKinnon, and Kali have. Everyone else still needs to go run under 2 1130 to really have a shot at doing this. How so big of a deal is the world championships? Like, and, you know, this year is going to have the first ever road half marathon and i mean road racing championships in riga latvia um that's a lot of breaking points on the line yeah well so you know the bigger the race the more points possibilities it's a combination of how big the race is what place you finish and how fast you ran and you know if you don't think you can go run 208 10 then finishing really high up at something like the world championships, which has the biggest number of bonus points available can really help secure the U S men's ranking that we need. So I'm definitely on team. Like let's hope our guys, our best guys go to the world championships and let's hope that they run well there. Um, I think Budapest is a great opportunity still. It's a flat, fast 10 K course and the conditions at the end of August are historically pretty good at 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, Another race that I think a lot of guys will be targeting if they're saying, hey, you know, I I still want to get my appearance fee or August is still a little too soon. That wasn't going to be in my schedule. Um, Then Berlin is a great option, as is Chicago. Starting to get maybe a little bit tighter of a window block, but it it can definitely be done. So again, don't want to be like too alarmist I, if I had to be a betting man, I think that everyone's going to have to do what they have to do in order to get three guys there. But if things stay as they are and everyone's just waiting for someone else to go do it, then there's a high likelihood that no one goes. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Uh, the last update from a couple weeks back from Runner's World is looking at the uh, top American men's marathoners right now. Connor Mance not likely to run the world championships. Scott Fobble, not planning on running uh, the world championships. Elkanah Kabet, yes, but he's currently deployed with the U.S. Army in Poland, but will accept the spot if he is offered. Zach Panning, yes, according to coach Kevin Hansen, who actually went out to Budapest and like already scouted the course. Leonard Career didn't respond. Uh, Galen Rupp, no, he's planning to run a fall marathon. Futsum, uh said he would consider it if offered a spot, according to his agent. That was the update from Runner's World. Uh, I guess they could still probably like change their mind if they're reading some of these things. They're like, oh, uh, to get myself in the best position possible, I should just go uh, and finish. What is it? What would it be? Top 20 at Worlds and you might be good? Top 10 will definitely help, uh, but you get points 20. I mean, we, we know that Panning wants to go. Panning just ran the London night of the 10,000 meter PBs, ran a 27.51. Nice little personal best there. 
you know, don't sleep on Zach Panning if he gets an opportunity to go. Um, you know, he's run 209-28 Chicago, which the window for the Olympics opens up, I believe, November 1st, and Chicago being in October is not part of that. So he at least needs his 211-30. Um, Boston, by the way, does not count. CIM does not count. But so, if you finish if you finish top five like Emma did in Boston, that does count. That does. Yeah. So it's here. Let's just do major takeaways. It's very confusing. It's super like there's so much going on. But if it works out and we we get enough guys to hit the standard to be ranked high enough, then the ideal situation is that fans can watch the Olympic trials and just know that whoever finishes top three is going to win. Well, wasn't there also, I guess, like the problem in 2020 was that we faced something similar too, but then I think like it ended up being that the Olympic trials is deemed like a platinum level race. And so then like the top now. three, yeah. but they're not doing that this time around. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's imagine us trying to wrap our heads around this, the casual fan, you know, figuring this whole thing out. So it should be interesting. There's still plenty of time. No need to panic, like you said, but uh, just be proactive. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, um, Mac, you you've been quiet. What do you are you digesting? No, it's just, it? no, I mean, it's, just it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous. You shouldn't have to do this in order to. Like, how does a how does a person that doesn't follow running, you know, like I'm struggling to understand. Yeah. I hope the we listeners people able to or, be or people watching this have been able to keep up with like all I the hope different they're taking things. notes. Yeah. I do want yeah. to just note that there's there's two situations here that I do not have a clear answer on and I'm trying to get a clear answer on. So you can qualify through the standard 20810 mm-hmm. or being ranked in the top 65. I want to know if those are exactly the same thing or if you go standard then fill out the field going down the disorder the sending order list of rankings. And in the rankings, you take out a max of three per country. Um, but so the problem is, is that the Olympics have has a very strict field size of 80. So right now there's 49 men who have the standard. What happens if 85 guys have the standard or if 70 guys have the standard and then there's an additional 20 guys that are in the top 65 like the olympics this is not world athletics this is the world championships like the olympics doesn't just let more people in so don't know what's happening there and the other thing is still very ambiguous of whether or not you're allowed to chase because the window is open for a few months after the olympic trials so if you finish in the mm. top three and let's say you haven't run to 11 30 can you go run it or can you go get your ranking up or, you know, so. We're forcing these marathoners to run marathons. Uh, would it have made sense to make the U.S. championships at a, on a legal course? Or a fast course. Or a fast course that was illegal? I don't know. That's just another thing that's like, it sucks for CIM because our good Americans aren't going to go run that. And it sucks, you know, for, I don't know. Chicago it seems fast. like you could have lined those up to, uh, you know, to help each other out a little bit. I don't know. You know, you know to post the actual championship. I uh, want. I wanted to put on the conspiracy theorist hat again for uh, for this one. And it would just be like, why doesn't Chicago, New York, just? I mean, this is more the ball's more in Chicago's uh, court because they're better on the schedule. Just trim down the number of uh, international athletes you invite to the race, and then you can have a better chance of putting, you know, three Americans in the top five. I don't know, just a thought. It doesn't have to look all that obvious. Invite the defending champion back, and then maybe like two or three other uh, international athletes, and really make it American heavy. I don't know. Just give it some thought. All right. Uh, Let's move to the races we're looking forward to most this weekend. I'm getting on a plane uh, to to Los Angeles, and I will be attending the LA Grand Prix, which lost quite a bit of its uh, spice in the last couple of weeks with Sydney McLaughlin and Athingmo scratching, and then Michael Norman scratch. But it should still be a pretty good uh, two days of racing. The distance night is on Friday, um, and then 
the marquee action will be taking place on Saturday. Uh, Timothy Chariot is in is, is making the trip all the way out there to run the fifteen hundred. Uh, Mondo Duplantis, a bunch of Olympic medalists and World Championship medalists, and then we've also got the Rabat Diamond League on Sunday. That's the one where for weeks people have been talking up uh, ourselves included, Fred Curley versus Marcel Jacobs. And then, you know, just last week we saw the 1500 meter fields be revealed and we see Jakobinga Britson getting uh, to face off against uh, Yard Nagus for the first time. Actually, that sentence should be like the other way around. Yard gets to face Jakob for the first time. Um, and so there's there's lots of track on tap this weekend. We'll go to Mac first. Mac, what is the matchup that you're looking forward to the most? Uh, I think that Rabat 1500. Um, it's uh, there's other people in there. This field is stacked, and this is like close to uh, like a world final type of level race. Uh, I'm curious to see how Ollie opens up. His focus this year um has to be like race less so he's got a little bit more juice later in the season so i think this is his first outdoor 15 th- this year um curious to him uh mario garcia you know, fourth place at worlds uh he's you know looking to upgrade that to a medal uh yard and goose he hasn't lost in what is it nine races now something like that yeah or eight races and like it goes back to july of last year basically ever since he turned you know he signed with uh with the oac and started went out to europe i think that's when the winning streak really started he's going in with a pb of 333.26 so look look for a new pb out of him um and then yeah you have Jakob and you have charles chaboy uh Samotuo. he's got a 330 pb and then who else is in here um well, it's a bunch of Moroccan. Keep saying 329 got yeah. It's the the field is absolutely loaded. So, um, it, I think it's going to be fast. There's enough guys that have uh, season bests already in the low 330s. So I think it's going to be fast. And I'm just, I mean, I love the 1500. It's the best event track and field. Picks, picks. Yeah, make your picks. Pick. Make my pick. Oh, um, ah, uh, keep saying. <laughs> oh i like yeah. it it's not a bad pick no it's not at all it's yeah the, the guy's got serious credentials for early season uh I, I like him so we put up the graphic on instagram uh Jakob versus yarid and the comment section popped off expectedly i mean the oac guys have a very loyal fan base and so does Jakob. Uh, kyle not crazy to think that Yard could win this one. It's not crazy. I mean, he, he just showed fitness. He, he has a faster 800 personal best than Jakob now, but there's recency there. You know, we know that he's fit and strong after the indoor season, but we also know that he's fit because of two weeks ago. Um, so Jakob coming in with a little bit more question mark, but Jakob doesn't race unless he's fit, especially against the field that he's going up against here. Look, um, I'll say this. I think Jakob is the favorite. If I had to like bet my life on someone winning, I'm picking Jakob because he hasn't done anything that would indicate that he's not still Jakob. But uh, I fully understand and will not be surprised when Yared is on his ass with 50 meters to go. Yeah. I mean, dude, I don't know. Can you employ uh, the Kenyans? Do they really try at the world championships to employ team tactics against Jakob, like how would the OEC guys do it? Like, is there a race plan? No, it's got to be better. It's got to be better. They're not doing that. I, I think that the key for for yards race is if he's if he can be close with like six hundred to go. Uh, he has a tendency to just. Besides that, Spain fifteen hundred where he got after it, but he you know got walked off the start line. Um, he's just he's got to be close because Jakob or Kip Singh is going to be pulling hard with five hundred to go. And it's just, you know, these guys are the best in the world and you can't necessarily kick down everyone, but Yard seems to kind of prove everyone wrong about that. But he's still got to do it. He's got to beat these guys. Chris, pick, pick. Jakob. Uh, but the other part of it too is sort of like, I just want it to be close between Yared and Jakob because our jobs are to, and we talked about this, Kyle, I guess, separately, that to promote these kinds of matchups, we want to see more banter and just 
the debate that just surrounded these two guys racing and yeah then you've got like mario garcia romo jumping in on the comment section it's like yeah but i have the most sec titles of of the whole bunch <laughs> and so the sec it sometimes it, it means more and uh so like i just wanted this to be close slander i think i think uh I, Jakob comes away with the win i just want uh yard to be in there like you said with you know 500 meters to go well Another race at Rabat that I'm going to say I'm most excited for, this men's 100. I mean, this is an Olympic final style 100 here. I mean, first off, you've got Marcel Jacobs and Fred Curley, who've been talking crap back and forth. And we're finally going to see a little matchup. I hope that they don't at any point, like, give each other a high five or a handshake or hug after the race. Like, I hope that they actually don't like each other. And um, but that doesn't mean that one of them is necessarily going to win. I mean, Jacobs hasn't raced 100 yet this season. He got beat by another Italian at the European Championships indoors in the 60. Um, you know, Fred did open up well in Japan last year, 988 uh, last week. And so the guy who's actually the favorite on paper from this season alone, though, is probably... Fernand Amanyala, right? Like he's run 978 wind aided, but then also 984 in a headwind, grants at altitude. Uh, he's race sharp, has been running well. Um, so, you know, definitely on paper, someone, if you're going off recency, don't sleep. Uh, and then just quickly to round out the field, uh, you've got Letzil Tobogo, who, you know, has run well so far this season. And then Trayvon Brumel, who hasn't run 100 yet this season, but always opens up super well. So I don't know. I, I don't even know who my pick is. So is there any level of concern with, you know, Love Fred? He's so talented. The amount of travel he's been putting in. He's been, he's been worldwide. He might be used to it, but he was just in Japan. That's on another plane. I don't know where he's been spending the last couple of days. He's got to get out to Rabat. Trayvon had that story when we sat down with him at Worlds about how, like, you know, that first race off the plane into, you know, uh, overseas is never really a good one. So that's what's stopping me from, like, you know, picking him. I guess Fred's already been on the other side of of the world, but yeah, there's, I, I there's enough, it, it, there's enough intrigue in this one where I think like there. There is no clear favorite except for, you know, you maybe give the edge to 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 Fred because he ran that 988 against no competition and it made it look easy. Uh, I think Fred wins. And I think that Jacobs probably finishes like third or fourth in this one. And sadly, that's going to take the bite out of uh, the next couple matchups. This is, we're supposed to get this in Florence as well. And then he's supposed to go face off against... Um, Noah Lyles in uh in Paris I, I you know after this weekend I think track fans are going to get less excited unless Marcel Jacobs does something to really wow us and be like oh okay all right the other ones are going to be worth tuning into but I mean it, it could end up being like oh, all right we saw him get his butt beat by four guys and so it doesn't he's you know he's he doesn't have as much shine after this weekend but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, the race I'm looking forward to the most is also a hundred, but it will be in LA. Uh, there's a lot of top names in this one, but the biggest one of which is Shakari Richardson, 10.72 seasons best, uh, right up there with, uh, no, wait, uh, not 10. That's her PR 10.76 is her season's best from Doha. Uh, also in the field, Marie Jose Talu, Aliyah Hobbs. So we're going to get Aliyah Hobbs versus Shakiri uh, before the U.S. Championships. The reigning U.S. champion, Melissa Jefferson, also in it. Makia Briscoe, Tiana Daniels, uh, English Gardner. Like this one is deep. Uh, but I'm very excited for Shakiri to show out in a major U.S. market. I think like for there, hopefully, you know, I've seen video clips of like the ads that have been rolling in L.A. and um hopefully there are fans at this meet and shikari is entertaining enough that she's a show she's the ultimate showman when it comes to uh to to her on track you know display and so 
I am I'm here for I, I I'm here for the Shakari Richardson show in LA. Do you see her getting beat? No, she looks so good right now. I yeah. think this is her, this is her race, and um, you know there's concern. I guess now a month ago that she was in too good a shape too soon, and every weekend that she comes out and keeps showing up, uh, you know, I become more and more confident where we're going. Speaking of, you were on behind the mic at uh, Trials of Miles uh last weekend and got the chance to hang out with ray were you guys you know friendly the whole time you guys go back and forth on 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 twitter constantly ray's like a you know well i think we all are we're all like twitter philosophers in the sport of track and field right um i actually i didn't talk to ray except on the broadcast because oh, really? that was the only time that I, I i showed up immediately sat down on broadcast and as soon as i finished i i left so um yeah but it was fun i mean you know love love what charles miles guys are doing i'm happy that they're able to plug into sidious to help show a lot of live free track for people some some great races including bryce hopple and aj wilson who will both be in la so Mm -hmm. yeah good good stuff i mean we're in the meat of the season now i feel like a few weeks ago i was like what am i going to write about this week in the lab count nothing is happening and now it's really picking and choosing yeah, there's a whole lot. Then next weekend we got Rome and Portland Track Festival, and after that Paris. Uh, we're starting to go. Sidious Mag is going global now. We've got David McCarthy and Johnny Pace will be hitting our uh, Europe meets. Uh, I will be heading out to Kenya on a little bit of a content gathering trip uh, in in a few weeks as well. So uh, to keep up with everything. I would tell people to visit SidiousMag.com. That is our wow. new home yeah. for all things track and field, whether it's our podcasts, our newsletters, our articles. Uh, it's all in one place now, easier to find, brand new look and redesign. So uh, I want to know what the fans think. Uh, let us, you know, if there's, we're, we're going to be looking for new contributions from, from writers at some point, uh, but yeah, now all you have to do is go to SidiousMag.com. Max got the the new logo on his water bottle. Um, and oh, I didn't get one of those. I just have Olipop. Yeah, I just have Olipop too. All right, well, we'll catch you guys next week when we unpack all of these race results and so much more. I, I bet there's going to be more problems to solve on next week. Should we say real quick plug for Jenkins though? Oh, yeah, that's right. If if you're listening to this on the City of Smack podcast feed, the episode right before this is the Eric Jenkins uh, exit interview. It was awesome. We went 70 minutes walking through everything from his high school days where he's vandalizing his own cross country course to, uh, you know, transfer the messy transfer from Northeastern to Oregon, what it took to beat, you know, Ed Chez at NCAAs and you know, his professional career, which has its own ups and downs. It was a fascinating conversation. He was an open book. And, you know, now fans will get the opportunity to ask Eric anything because we're going to test out a new little show concept on the City of Smag podcast. We're calling it Eric Jenkins Radio. So all you have to do is call into the voicemail line. It's already set up. I think it's my voice on there. But he's gotta he's gotta uh, add his voice to the voicemail line. But the number is six four six seven eight zero nine two one eight. Leave him whatever question you want. It could be, you know, looking for running advice, dating advice, life advice. Eric Jenkins is your man for it. And so, you know, we've seen what Pat McAfee has done to really transcend in the football space. We're going to try and, you know, really give Eric his start to building his own sort of uh, media empire, but check it out. The Eric Jenkins exit interview. Uh, And we'll catch you guys next time.